Welcome back, everyone, to the fifth and final episode in this fantastic series that I hope you've enjoyed as much as I have on the Great Northern War, which is one of the most uh, consequential events uh, of European history that nobody knows about. Well, at least nobody outside of the areas involved directly in this war. So um, we've mostly been talking about the direct involvement of uh, Charles the Twelfth or Carl the Twelfth of Sweden and his interaction with Peter the Great of Russia. But there were a lot of other players in all of this. Uh, and at some point, maybe in the next few weeks, we'll dive into one of the other channels. Uh, that, there's a couple of channels out there that some of you have suggested to me that have some great resources on focusing more on the military aspect of this war and the tactics involved and things like that. So we'll probably take a look a little deeper at that as well as at some of the Sabaton songs associated with uh, some of the folks involved here and some of the battles involved, uh, but that's for down the road. I am off to Pittsburgh this afternoon, and I will be in Pittsburgh through Friday afternoon. So I'm trying to record a couple of videos this uh, today uh, to have for you throughout the week, including maybe another oversimplified video. So be watching for that. Let's dive into part five. Tattered remnants of the Swedish army fly south. Charles hopes to find succor within the Ottoman Empire, but Peter is hard on his heels. <music> Nearly starving, suffering from the heat, the remaining Swedes raced south until they arrived at the very border of the Black Sea. But as the local prince haggled over prices for boats to ferry them into the Ottoman Empire, Peter overtook the Swedish rearguard. 800 were lost, only 500 remained. So the question, of course, is why did they go south? Why didn't they go north to get back to Sweden? Well, it, it was cut off. It was unavailable to them. Uh, they had to go where they could go. Uh, and this was a case of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, so the Ottomans are very traditional enemies of the Russians uh, who have kind of set themselves up as... Um, a, a natural enemy to a border, uh, a bordering uh, empire to their south uh, that they have some disputes with as far as land and territory and things like that. Uh, so it makes sense in th that aspect for uh, Charles to go south and seek the Ottomans for help. But those 500 made their way into the Sultanate. There they were treated regally, given food and drink, even allowed to set up an almost autonomous colony which the Ottomans helped them to build. But Peter did not relent. As his forces approached the border of the empire, he demanded that Charles be handed over. The Sultan, who was no friend of the Russians, refused, so Peter decided to force the issue. He would bring war to the Ottoman Empire itself. His army, augmented by forces from Moldovia, plunged towards Pluth River, where- So this is probably a calculated risk by the Sultan in the Ottoman Empire that he probably doesn't think the Russians will actually follow through and go to war over a couple of hundred measly uh, Swedes that are set up in a little colony in their northern regions, but he does. Where they were rapidly cut off by the giant home army of the Ottoman Empire. For a moment, it looked as though Peter and his entire force might fall into the Sultan's hands. But where Peter and his subordinates had clearly lost the war, you might argue that they won the peace. Deftly using diplomacy to extricate his army, Peter was allowed to leave the Ottoman territory with his army intact for little more than an agreement to give Charles safe passage back to Sweden. Interesting. Um... So, I mean, that's cool in one aspect for Charles that he's able to go back to Sweden. Uh, it also shows you that Peter the Great is probably better at the diplomatic end of things than Charles the Twelfth is, uh, who really only seemed to be good at one thing, which is war. And even that, I don't know if you can argue he was good at, but he certainly enjoyed it and felt at home at it. And a handful of very minor territorial concessions. But this was not good enough for Charles. He pushed the Sultan to make war on the Russians. The Sultan had no interest in such a costly project. He was basically like, we won you the right to go home, man. Just go home. Take Charles it like then it. decided to be the ultimate bad house guest and declared, all right, I live here now. To which the Sultan replied, dude, come on. And Charles responded, I will cut you. At which point the Sultan, in his infinite patience, said, Look, I will give you 10,000 pounds if you will just leave. Charles took this payment, and then, like any bad house guest, said, 
All right, I will leave if you give me 8,000 more. <laughs> At which point the Sultan Man. was like, okay, time to call the sheriff before remembering, oh wait, I'm the sheriff. And then promptly surrounded Charles's small force and threw him into jail. After cooling his heels for a while, Charles... Like I said, Charles not real good at the whole diplomatic end of things. Had he been half as good at diplomacy as he was at leading men in combat, might have had a different outcome. ...was, at last, allowed to return to Sweden. And it was at this point that good old Augustus the Strong, deposed King of Poland, returns to the spotlight. After having a good long think, he had finally decided, you know... I have heard good things about winning. New plan? <laughs> Let's try that. I've heard good things about winning. We should try that. That's awesome. He was super excited about this plan. And, I mean, why wouldn't he be? It's a pretty solid plan. Anyway, he... So just as a reminder, um, he is not only... Uh, has has been, anyway, the king of Poland-Lithuania, um, but also is the um, prince-elector of Saxony. This is a time when... Um, the Holy Roman Empire is made up of these um, small autonomous states that uh, many of whom have prince electors, which uh, basically means that they have a vote on uh, the elective title of Holy Roman Emperor. When the Holy Roman Emperor dies, you got to choose a new one. It's not a hereditary title, though it did often get passed down in a hereditary way. Um, and these electors then would be the ones that would choose the next one. ...to basically roll Swedish forces back to the very borders of Polish-Lithuanian territory. Then, after a heroic last effort from the Swedish troops, he bottled them up in a fortress in Holstein Gottorp. And, when no aid came to save them, he forced them to surrender. The last truly major army of the Swedes had vanished. So the dominoes began to fall. Russia, Norway, and Poland-Lithuania were already at war with Sweden. Those who had fallen out of the alliance due to previous defeats were now back in. Then the King of England got into the mix, under his other title as Elector of Hanover. And yeah, so um, I, I mentioned this back in the first episode that England eventually gets involved in this, and some people were like, no, no, they didn't. They were involved in the War of Spanish Succession. True to a point, but they did get involved in this, just not technically as the English. Uh, the King of England, uh, beginning with George I, uh, who uh, was German, and uh, it was only Ger George III who was the... So it goes George I, George II, his son, and then George II's grandson is George III. George III is the first uh, member of the Hanoverian dynasty whose first language is English. Um before that, you know, these kings have been from Hanover, and uh, eventually, in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars, Hanover becomes a kingdom. And so, uh, beginning with George the Third, then you have uh, the King of England also being King of Hanover, at least for George the Third, George the Fourth, and William the Fourth. And then, once once uh, the crown passes to Victoria in England, it can't pass to a female uh, in Hanover. So then, Victoria's cousin becomes the King of Hanover. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it's it's in his role as uh, the uh, Prince Elector of Hanover, uh, I think it's a Prince Elector, um, that he is involved in this war. And then so did Prussia. So at this point, Sweden is basically at war with all of Northern Europe. Their resources are tapped, and the great armies that had swept them to empire were now shattered or imprisoned. But Charles was not deterred. Never one to surrender, never one to make peace. He raised what forces he could and kicked off a campaign in Norway. And this began pretty well. He cut his way through the thin Danish-Norwegian defenses, threatening to overwhelm the knife at the back of Sweden. But then disaster struck in the Baltic. Norwegian naval forces ambushed the Swedish fleet, nearly wiping it out. This left Charles unable to resupply, and he was forced to retreat once again. Meanwhile, in Finland, which was part of Sweden at the time, the Russians had invaded. Initially, the going was slow. The Russians were impeded by poor roads and bad weather. But Peter, with his love of ships, settled on a new course of action. One where the Russian offensive would be centered on the coastline, where men and material could rapidly be transferred by sea. So, uh, I want to back up for just a second and address something. We've talked about this here and there. You might be finding yourself wondering why, for example... Uh, if the territory we know today as modern Finland is part of Sweden, why isn't that called Sweden, Finland, kind of like you have Denmark, Norway, and Poland, Lithuania, and Austria, Hungary? 
The difference is, and the reason why those nations have those hyphenated names, is because they are autonomous kingdoms that are under a, a crown that has joined them together. Uh, for example, the same thing happened for a while in Britain, where uh, when James the Sixth of Scotland becomes James the First of England, you have England and Scotland, still separate countries uh, that are not joined politically under a common crown. So the king of one is also the king of the other, even though they're still separate. It's only uh, when the the act of union is passed that they actually become under one government, and that's when they become Great Britain. Uh, and then eventually when you add Ireland to that, uh, you get you, the United Kingdom, um, which is now just Northern Ireland. But anyway, so, so these are actually... Um, countries that are still separate countries but they're under the same crown that's why they're called poland lithuania denmark norway but you don't have sweden finland finland's actually a part of sweden at this time the swedish commander in finland was continually on the retreat having neither the men nor the supplies necessary to contest the russians for this he was recalled and replaced with a man who was much more likely to agree to the native finns demand for a fight and fight they did, twice. But long gone were the days when Swedish forces could beat the Russians 8 to 1, or even mm. 2 to 1. The Swedish army in Finland was almost entirely made up of Finnish troops, not the Swedish corps who had done so much at the outset of the war. We talked about this in earlier episodes, that Sweden's got this very strong, very professional, very well-trained army, and that's, uh, that and the leadership... Uh, are two pieces of why they do so well early early on against what seemed to be long odds, but now you've lost that. You're not dealing with the same professional army because he's lost most of those those folks. Uh, so now it doesn't matter how good your leader is, you're going up against long odds with forces that don't perform the way your other ones did. Only to be eventually wiped out in Russia. This Finnish army was beaten back both times. This all occurred just before the Swedish Navy got stomped outside of Norway, and I'm sorry for how confusing these timelines are, but at this point everything is kind of happening at once. The Swedish fleet was sent to help out the Finnish forces, to take some of the pressure off. But Peter, great lover of sailing ships that he was, ironically used a fleet of galleys to blaze past them on a day in which the sea was calm. Soon, the Finnish front was untenable, and what troops were left were recalled to defend Sweden itself. But Charles was not yet done. He planned a return to Norway. He knew there was exactly one hope. He needed to capture <laughs> okay. the fortress so of Fredrikstad. That's a little, very... um, you've got R2-D2 there. So if you're not familiar with Star Wars, um, in the original Star Wars movie from 1977, uh, you've got that scene where R2-D2 shows a um, image of Princess Leia giving a message to Obi-Wan Kenobi, and she says, Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. So that's the reference there. The same place he had just lost his fleet failing to capture. He raised another 22,000 men for his last attempt to turn things around. Their campaign in Norway was hard going, always in want of rations, having to swim across rivers or climb whole mountains to achieve the positioning that Charles wanted. But despite this suffering, Swedish discipline won out. And through this privation, the army never truly wavered, because they had always the example of their king, who always took the roughest tasks for himself. By November 1718, they made it to the fortress. Charles himself led an assault on the outer works and overwhelmed them with his loyal grenadiers. So even after all this time, Charles is in his mid-30s now. Uh, he's starting to go bald. You can see in the images of him at this later time in his life, and you can actually see in the pictures that they have of his skull that he's very much balded at this point. He's not the young kid that he used to be, but he's still out front leading the attacks. Things were progressing nicely, but now the fortress had to be breached. On the 30th of November, mm -hmm. Charles went to inspect the trench works. Laughing and joking with the men, he encouraged them in their work. Then, as night fell, the defenders put burning wreaths on the fortress wall to illuminate the surrounding ground. The king suspected that they might sortie out and try to smash the progress that had been made on the siege works before returning to the safety of their fort. So he climbed to the lip of the trench to get a better look. A nearby French officer, who had just joined the Swedes, called out to him, That is no fit place for your majesty. Musket 
And this kind of thing has happened in other situations. Spotsylvania, 1864, you've got the Union Corps commander, John Sedgwick, the highest ranking Union soldier killed during the entire American Civil War, uh, is being warned by his men about Confederate sharpshooters in the area. And he turns to one of them and says they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And seconds later, falls from his horse dead. Uh, same thing here. Your Majesty, you might want to reconsider popping your head up from the trench. Nah, it's good. Kit balls and cannonballs have as little respect for the king as for the common soldier. The king simply responded, don't be afraid. And one of the Swedish officers told the Frenchman, let him be. The more you warn him, the more he'll expose himself. The moon now washed the whole battlefield in a... And you have to think, too, I mean... All the things that Charles has been through, all the times he's led from the front, his Normandy-like uh, landing on the beaches early in the war, he, he probably has this sense of invincibility. You know, I, I'm called by God to this role. He, he put me in this position. I have nothing to fear. When it's my time, it's my time. And until then, I'm basically invincible. Well, it's his time. Pale light. Soldiers worked. Officers directed. And then... There was a soft, wet sound, no louder than that of a rock gently dropped into a pool. The king was dead. A shot had passed through his left temple and out the right. He died where he lay, right at the top of the trench works. The succession passed to his sister. So uh, let's talk about this for a second because there's so much speculation about what happened to the king. Uh, they can't even agree on what exactly killed him. Uh, there was talk that no bullet could kill him. And so some people say it was actually a button that went through his head. Uh, and there and there was an investigation done. Nobody actually saw him go down. They saw the aftermath. They saw him after he was down. But nobody saw the actual strike of what hit him in that moment. They heard it. Um, uh, and so nobody knew where it came from. Uh, was it one of his own men who wanted to go home and didn't want to be in the siege? Was it uh, a piece of shrapnel from grape shot fired from the fortress? Was it a bullet? Nobody really knows for sure. But the spirit of the army was gone. A retreat was made and preparations to defend the homeland began. But defense was only a dream. From 1719 to 1721, Sweden suffered brutal raids and incursions from the Russians until, at last, they were forced to make peace. Sweden had to cede almost all of its territory except for the home country itself and Finland. And we should say, too, that he mentioned how um, Charles's sister briefly takes over. She inherits the throne, but she marries a guy, uh, and, and the throne actually passes to him. Um... She remains queen, but she's the queen consort, which means she's not the reigning monarch her husband is. So he actually takes the throne from her. Uh, and, and basically, though, the absolute monarchy that Sweden has had will never be the same. Which, after an occupation known as the Great Wrath, the Russians agreed to leave be. The grand dream of Charles was smashed, and with it, the Swedish Empire. Sweden would never rise again to such a position of prominence on the world stage. But as Charles's dream lay in ruins, Peter's became a reality. Mm -hmm. Russia pushed westward, gaining ports along the Baltic coast. More importantly, they proved that they were a power on the rise, that no longer could calculations about European politics be made without factoring the Russians in. Thus, the Great Northern War ends, and the wheel turns as one empire falls and another rises. The rise of Russia at this point, uh, the fall of Sweden, I mean, that's how important the Great Northern War is. This is when Russia becomes a world power, and they've been one ever since. Uh, they will now be a factor in alliances. They're going to be a factor in things like the Napoleonic Wars. They're going to be a factor, a huge factor, in what sets off the Great War, World War I. Uh, all of these things happen because of the Great Northern War. So again, everything's connected. So let me know your thoughts about all that. Use the comment section below. And uh, make sure you have notifications turned on so you don't miss the other content that will be going live this week, including the next episode from my visit to the Vicksburg battlefield. So check that out soon. Thanks for watching.